Isaiah 30, 27 through 33. Isaiah 30, 27 to 33. This is now the word of God. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from a remote place. Burning is his anger and dense is his smoke. His lips are filled with indignation and his tongue is like a consuming fire. His breath is like an overflowing torrent which reaches to the neck to shake the nations back and forth in a sieve and to put in the jaws of the peoples the bridle which leads to ruin. You will have songs as in the night when you keep the festival and gladness of heart as when one marches to the sound of the flute to go to the mountain of the Lord to the rock of Israel. And the Lord will cause his voice of authority to be heard and the descending of his arm to be seen in fierce anger and in the flame of a consuming fire in cloudburst, downpour, and hailstones. For at the voice of the Lord, Assyria will be terrified when he strikes with the rod. And every blow of the rod of punishment which the Lord will lay on him will be with the music of tambourines and lyres. And in battles, brandishing weapons, he will fight them. For Topheth has long been ready. Indeed, it has been prepared for the king. He has made it deep and large, a pyre of fire with plenty of wood. The breath of the Lord, like a torrent of brimstone, sets it afire. Let's pray. Father, we come before you again tonight, and we do, Lord, confess the words of the song we just sang, that we need you. Every hour we need you. And Lord, that doesn't change whether we're in danger in the world or whether we're seated safely in a church pew, we are always in need of you. We could not exist one moment without your mercy. We would never be pleasing apart from your righteousness. We would not worship you if you had not first revealed yourself to us, if you had not given us your spirit and caused us to love you, if you had not given us an understanding of your word and a desire for it, if you had not written it on our hearts, we would never comprehend it. Lord, we need you even in this very hour, and we ask for that grace as we worship. We ask for you to speak to us. We ask for you to confront our hearts, Lord, in whatever manner you see fit, for you know the heart. And we ask you, God, to accomplish your work through the study of your word. Make it clear for us. We need this, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we started what we call this invitation. It's really what it is. It's almost as though it's a letter written from the prodigal's father to the prodigal in the midst of his pursuits of worldliness. And it's very simply a come home letter. Let me tell you how I'll respond. If you'll turn from your sin and you'll come to me and you'll humble yourself and you'll repent, this is how I'll respond to you. I promise there is a certain grace that will be available for you. There is a provision that will be available for you. There is a hope that is available for you. And I will give it to you, I promise. This has been the invitation that the Lord gave and we started looking at even this morning. The reason, of course, is because in Isaiah 30, God has revealed that these people are false sons. It's actually a staggering and terrifying realization and revelation. Jesus did the same when he came to the children of Israel, these people who thought themselves to be God's people. And Jesus says, if you were children of Abraham, you would do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you seek to kill me, something Abraham did not do. No, you are of your father, the devil. Jesus had no problem calling out Israel as false sons. Isaiah has done the same. Ungrateful, rebellious, they will not obey God. But despite all their rebellion, God has not turned his back on them completely. He longs to be gracious to them. He waits to have compassion. He wants them to be saved. Isaiah 30, 19, as we studied this morning, O people in Zion, inhabitant in Jerusalem, you will weep no longer. He will surely be gracious to you. At the sound of your cry, when he hears it, he will answer you. It's a reassuring promise to these who have lived their lives in nothing but falsehood and hypocrisy. The Lord, instead of writing them off, calls them to come back with a promise of certain grace. It just doesn't get any better than that. And as we said this morning, this is also a promise that rings true even into the days of Jesus, to the days of the apostles, and even into our day. As Peter preached in Jerusalem in Acts 3.19, he told them the same message, Therefore, repent and return. So that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. What do you mean times of refreshing? Well, I mean the same thing Isaiah said. Grace, provision, hope. He'll send it. It's the millennial reign. 
that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Peter said this is the period of restoration of all things. The prophets talked about it, and this is one of those instances in which the prophets talk about that period of restoration. We are talking now in sort of a dual arena. In one hand, it's the immediate threat of the Assyrian Empire. In one hand, it's the immediate danger that Isaiah and his contemporaries face. But on the other hand, it is a bigger, more eternal message to even what will happen to Israel when they return to Christ today. It's all bound up in one. But the point to be made that we saw this morning is that for those prodigals who will repent and return, grace, compassion, provision, hope, they're all yours. For those prodigals who will not return, there is nothing but judgment. Well, we looked at the first half of that this morning, the grace. Tonight, let's look at the second half of that. Let's look at the judgment. We're going to call it a glimpse of wrath. What I want you to understand, and you picked up on the wrath pretty quickly as we started reading in verse 27, but what I want you to understand is that Isaiah is still in the invitation section. This is still part of that letter that that prodigal father would have written to that prodigal son. It's still there. And you might immediately assume that this is the second half good cop, bad cop portion of the letter. You know, he wrote and he said, oh son, I love you. I miss you. I wish you would come home. If you would come home and repent and return, I would give you grace and I would give you provision and I would give you hope and it would be wonderful. Please come home. Please come home. Please come home. But if you don't, death, right? It's not what he's writing. It's not a letter that is an, on the first page, oh, it will be good if you come home, and on the second page, this fiery threat, but if you don't, I will hunt you down. I know where you live, and I've seen where you sleep. And I, I mean, that's not what this is. This invitation and the wrath that he speaks about here has nothing to do with his people. This wrath is not geared at his people. This wrath is focused on those who afflict his people. This is him writing to say, on one hand, I will be gracious to you, I will provide for you, I will give you hope, and I will thoroughly annihilate those who oppress you. Not only will I bring you home and give you grace, but I'm going after those pigs that mistreated you too. I'm going to get them, and I'm going to fully deliver you from those who afflict you. This is a father writing to his people saying, you have no other option you have no better option than me. Zechariah may have stated the reality, the plainness. It's the one you're probably most familiar with in Zechariah 2.8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after glory he has sent me against the nations which plunder you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. You've heard that. There is a love for the Father, for those whom he's chosen, even in their rebellion, even in their obstinance, even in their sin, even in their hypocrisy, He does not quit loving them. He does not quit calling them. I had someone come in my office last week, week before, I don't know, and wanted to know my thoughts on the Israeli Hamas thing, you know. This particular person uh, is on the thread of uh, conspiracy theories and, you know, all that kind of stuff, which are are fun. But his um, take on this was that, you know, Israel is is a bad, bad nation, that Israel is a corrupt nation, that Israel is a nation that needs to be purified and cleansed and dealt with. And so by his take and his understanding, this conflict was a good thing that will go in and clean house and, and uh, get Israel cleaned up. And listen, I don't care who Israel is. We don't condone immorality. We don't condone if it's human rights or abortion or anything like that. I mean, Israel doesn't get a free pass on sin just because they're Israel. The Lord knows if you read the Bible, God has never given them a free pass on sin. You can start in the period of the judges and find out that God has afflicted them and afflicted them and afflicted them and afflicted them and afflicted them them for their sin. However, we also learn throughout scripture that despite their moments of rebellion and despite those times when God would raise up another nation to afflict them and discipline them, it was always a very strict warning to that nation, you had better be careful. Don't go too far. If you take one inch beyond what I intended you to take, you are not going to be happy with it. We already saw that previously in Isaiah with Assyria. Remember Isaiah 10 verse 5, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, And the staff in whose hands is my indignation. I send it against a godless nation and commission it against the people of my fury to capture booty and to seize plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. That was my call, God says. Yet it, Assyria, does not so intend. 
nor does it plan so in its heart, but rather it is its purpose to destroy and to cut off many nations. You went too far. Later in Isaiah 10, 16, Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, will send a wasting disease among his stout warriors, and under his glory a fire will be kindled like a burning flame, and the light of Israel will become a fire, and his holy one a flame, and it will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in a single day, and he will destroy the glory of his forest and of his fruitful garden, both soul and body, and it will be as when a sick man wastes away, and the rest of the trees of his forest will be so small in number that a child could write them down. Big mistake. Don't overstep. Seeking the destruction of the people of God is a fast track to experiencing the wrath of God. And that's not just true for Israel in the Old Testament. That's true for his church today. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians who suffered extreme persecution. In 2 Thessalonians 1, Paul says, For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. Paul wrote even to the church, Look, when the Lord comes... He will get even. He will avenge you. He will deal out retribution to those who have afflicted you. They will pay the penalty of eternal fire in flame. They will constantly be punished at the hand of God. And that's how Isaiah 30 ends, with that same reality preached to Israel as an invitation. As if to say, God is for you. Not only will he give you grace, not only will he provide, not only will he give you hope, but God will deal with your enemy. God will handle him. God will take care of him. You should come to God. You don't have a deliverer like him. You don't have a savior like him. So as we study these final few verses, if you're a child of God, let this segment encourage you. You've got a God who most certainly will avenge you and defend you and care for you and vindicate you. And someday those who afflict you will wish they hadn't. You'll enjoy it. If you are not a child of God, Certainly the wrath that we read of here is the wrath you're in line for apart from repentance. But even more than that, it is a call for you to come to one. You don't have another person in this world that will defend you like this. You don't have another person in this world that will take up your cause like this. You have never had another advocate that would stand for you like this against those who hate you. You're going to want to come to him. So we're going to look at this glimpse of wrath tonight. The way we're going to talk about it, I'm just going to give you five different words as we use these words to describe what God will do to those who afflict his people. The first word I want to give you is the word torrent. Torrent. Look at verses 27 and the first half of 28. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from a remote place. Burning is his anger and dense is his smoke. His lips are filled with indignation and his tongue is like a consuming fire. His breath is like an overflowing torrent which reaches to the neck. You see where we get the word torrent. A torrent, if you look up the definition, means a strong or fast-moving stream of water. That's what a torrent is. It's a tidal wave. It is a river that just takes out everything in its path. It becomes an analogy then for a sudden and violent outpouring. It's a flash flood. And in a moment, it just mows over everything in its path. And Isaiah here uses that startling word to begin when he says, Behold, you need to pay attention. It's a word that comes upon you suddenly. Out of nowhere, surprise, which is in fact what he says. The name of the Lord comes from a remote place. God comes out of nowhere. And he comes angry. And he comes smoking. And he comes speaking indignation. And he comes blowing fire. And he comes breathing fire. If you want the picture, it's this. It is a boy, or let's let's say it's a bride. It's a man's wife and... She has gone somewhere and she's secluded alone and a band of thugs come upon her to um, steal from her, mug her, rob her, whatever. And they're beating on her. They don't think anybody sees. And all of a sudden they turn around and a dump truck plows right over the the top of them because the husband's driving the dump truck, right? Just all of a sudden, out of nowhere, pow, they're flattened. 
It, it was just this unexpected, look who showed up all of a sudden. You, you thought you were getting away with it. You thought you were afflicting her. You thought you were punishing her. You thought you were robbing her. You thought she couldn't do anything against you. You thought nobody could stop you. And out of nowhere, where'd that come from? And the husband just mows right over you. Fury, anger, mad, breathing fire, seeing red, we would say, coming out of nowhere, and he just plows over the enemies. That's the picture of God here. He's always watching. And on the day when he is finished disciplining his children, he will charge and run right over those who have thrown the punches. It's a violent expression of instant revenge, instant rage. You can't get over the words burning anger, dense smoke. Lips filled with indignation, tongues of consuming fire. His breath is an overflowing torrent. He's not coming to investigate what you did to his bride. He's not coming to break up the fight. He's not coming just to stop the bully. He is coming in full fury, full rage, full revenge to mow over the one who afflicted the one he loves. There's no mercy here. There's no restraint here. There's no understanding here. There's no delay here. He comes to annihilate the one who has attacked his bride. You just don't mess with the one God loves. That's the reality. It reminds me a little bit of the story, if you remember, the Amalekite who, when Saul and Jonathan had gone off to war and God had appointed that they would not survive the battle and this Amalekite comes upon Saul and Saul is leaning on his spear and according to the story of the Amalekite, he says that Saul told me he was still alive, that he wasn't going to survive and he wanted me to kill him before his enemies fell upon him. And this Amalekite says, so I did. I killed him. Here's the crown. Here's his seal. And I brought it to you, David. And David responded in 2 Samuel 1. David said to the young man who told him, where are you from? And he answered, I'm the son of an alien and a Amalekite. And David said to him, how is it that you are not afraid to stretch out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, go cut him down. So he struck him and he died. I mean, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to go out and wield the sword against one God loves. I don't think that was a wise move on your part. And that's the point. There is wrath and anger and vengeance and fury from God against those who afflict his people. Even if his people deserved it. This I've told you is what makes to me when you study the seals and the trumpets and the bowls and all that revelation. The scariest one, I think, is that fifth seal. And it's not the one that looks scary to people because all you see are the martyrs below the altar. And they're just like, hey, when are you going to avenge us? And nothing seems to happen on earth as a result of the opening of the fifth seal. What happens at the opening of the fifth seal is not on earth. What happens at the opening of the fifth seal is in heaven. When the Lord is stroked to anger, when the Lord is moved to fury, when the Lord has a conversation with those whom the world has mistreated and maligned and martyred, and he talks to them, and they ask him, when will you avenge me? And here's what happens next in Revelation 6. I looked when he broke the fifth seal, and there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree cast its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? Now, I'm not a great weatherman, though there's no such thing, I don't think, anymore. I don't understand the full significance of everything, but I do know this. When the Bible speaks of the sun rising, what's actually happening is the earth is spinning. We know that. And so when the Bible speaks of, you know, mountains leaving or stars falling... I don't know what actually happens here, but I'll tell you in my mind what happens here. When God looks below the altar and sees those who have been martyred and those who have been mistreated and they cry out to God and say, when will you avenge us? When will you deal with us? In my mind, God grabs the earth and reaches it right back to here. And all of a sudden, everything is pulled away and all of those men who afflicted his people go, oh darn, right? And they flee and they run to the mountains. We got to get out of here. This guy is angry and we want no part of this, right? That's what it looks like to me. It is fast. It is fury. It is out of nowhere. Even in Isaiah's day, he struck down 185,000. 185,000 in one night. No one defends his people like God defends his people. And this is the cry to Isaiah, to that prodigal. Why would you run to Egypt? Egypt will not do for you what God will do for you. 
Egypt doesn't care about you like God cares about you. That's an encouraging note to us, church. So the first word is torrent. The second word is target, as in who is the target of this wrath? Look at 28b through 29. It says there in 28, that third line, that God is coming to shake the nations back and forth in a sieve and to put in the jaws of the peoples the bridle which leads to ruin. You will have songs as in the night when you keep the festival and gladness of heart as when one marches to the sound of the flute to go to the mountain of the Lord to the rock of Israel. The simple point discussed here is when God's wrath comes, who will feel it? Who is he angry at? Who is he focused on? And we find again, just as we found with grace this morning, that it's not universal. He is not here to destroy his people. He is here to shake the nations back and forth in a sieve. This is a testing process. This is a filtering process. I'm going to find out who's been naughty or nice, right? And those who are found to have afflicted his people, he will put in the jaws of the peoples the bridle which leads to ruin. Psalm 32 taught us about the bit and the bridle, right? It's what you put in the mouth of a horse to make him go where he doesn't want to go. Well, this is the nations, those who have afflicted his people. We don't want to go to judgment. (laughs) Sorry. And he puts the bridle in their mouth, and they go to judgment. They go to destruction. God will run roughshod over these nations and lead them to destruction. There will be no mercy. And then you see the response of his people. This is remarkable. This is how we know it's not wrath on everybody because look at what his people do in verse 29. You will have songs as in the night when you keep the festival. I mean, while they're being bound and led to judgment, you're going to throw a party. You're going to have gladness of heart as when one marches to the sound of the flute to go to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. We spent, I don't know, probably about 10 weeks. I don't remember how many there were, but something along that, all those psalms of ascents. You remember those? in the end of the book of Psalms, and they're all songs sung as a a reminder of what you sang as you went up to the the city of Jerusalem. And they all start with that Hallel, right? Praise the Lord. They were songs of a sense that here we go. And it was just the excitement. We're going to go to the the Lord's house. We're going to go to where the Lord dwells. We're going to go to worship him. And you get pictures of David dancing before the ark. And you get pictures of Jerusalem just busting at the seams in a great celebration. And all kinds of parties and all kinds of enjoyment and songs and dancing and feasting. And that's going to be the response of God's people. Why? Because their enemy just got grabbed by the cheek and drug away to judgment. How do you think the Jews would have responded in Jesus' day if Jesus would have walked in, stomped his foot, and kicked every Roman out of Jerusalem? That city would have busted at the seams, wouldn't it? Well, that's what will happen here. That's what God will do for his people. He's not angry at them here. He's angry at those who afflicted him. This is not a judgment on his people. We know that. Romans 8.1 says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's gone. 1 Thessalonians 5, it's a great assurance to the church. Now as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they're saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. That's what Isaiah said in it, just out of nowhere, pow. He says, but you, brethren, you're not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you're all sons of light and sons of day. We're not of night nor of darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we're of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, So that whether we're awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. God's salvation is for those who repent. God's wrath is for those who do not. His target is sinners, not sons. The day of God's vengeance will be a sad day for those who are not his people. It'll be a glorious day for those who are. Rejoicing, feasting, celebrating, and what an invitation to the children of Israel. You're going to be happy you're going to celebrate, you're going to party. Does Egypt promise you such deliverance? Does Egypt guarantee you such a celebration? Do you think that if you run to Egypt, they will so thoroughly deal with your enemy that it will be a glorious feast all over the city? They can't, but God can. You should most certainly repent and turn to your father. So you have a torrent, target. Here's the third word, terror. Look at verses 30 and 31. 
And the Lord will cause his voice of authority to be heard, and the descending of his arm to be seen in fierce anger, and in the flame of a consuming fire, in cloud bursts, downpour, and hailstones. For at the voice of the Lord, Assyria will be terrified when he strikes with the rod. And just when you thought that God showing up and pummeling your enemy was all it entailed, you realize, oh no, we're not done yet. After God shows up, after he runs roughshod over the enemy, after he puts a bridle in his mouth and leads him to destruction, then God lights this flame of consuming fire. Then comes the cloud burst. You remember the cloud burst? We had one of those here, I don't know, about 12 years ago in Spur when it blew the roof off the bus barn. You remember that? Everybody thought it was a tornado, and they said, no, it's just when a cloud releases all its energy, and it just goes right there on top of you. It wasn't a, pres- wasn't a pleasant day. Downpour, hailstones. This is the judgment of God. He will cause, look at this, he will cause his voice of authority to be heard. He will cause the descending of his arm to be seen. You know, the bully thus far has had no problem afflicting God's people because he's never heard from God. He's never seen God. He just thinks God is some sort of fairy tale. I mean, you can hear Sennacherib as he surrounds Jerusalem and says, don't let Hezekiah cause you to trust God. I mean, who is God? God can't help you. God can't deliver you. Has any God ever delivered? I mean, they're all just a bunch of, uh, you know, fairy tale stories for children at bedtime. He's not real until the day when God says, hello, you know, and you just back up and say, oh my gosh, who is that? God shows up. And he heard the voice of God's indignation. And he saw God rear back his arm. And Isaiah says that he saw his arm to be descending in fierce anger. It's not a pleasant scene when you're on the bottom and you see God raise his arm and here it comes. He feels God pick him up and toss him into the flame. And what's the result of all of God's behavior? Terror. You see it in 31. For at the voice of the Lord, Assyria will be terrified when he strikes with the rod. I don't know if you've ever felt genuine terror in your life. Usually associated with, I thought I would die. Genuine terror or fear. I don't know if you've ever felt that. But when you're under the wrath and judgment of God, that's a continual feeling. It never lets up. It is constant terror all the time. There is no break. There is no pause. We're talking about a constant, unrelenting experience of absolute fear and dread that will never give up, never end, never stop. Hebrews 10.31 says it like this, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Jonathan Edwards once made an analogy, I couldn't find the exact quote, but it doesn't matter. Have you ever tried to look at the sun? Uh, I tried to get the kids to do this a couple Wednesday nights ago whenever they were talking about Moses and the burning bush, and so you walk those boys out there and you know, you can't. You can't look at it for more than a second. I mean, it's too much. By the way, the earth, uh, the sun is 93 million miles away. And and you can't look at it for more than a second. Can you imagine what it will be like to walk into the presence of the one who made it? I mean, you can't handle that thing from 93 million miles away. And you're instantly going to enter the presence of the one who shines brighter than the sun. You're going to stand in his presence. We call that terror. If you're not covered in the righteousness of his son, it's more terror than you can imagine. There's no comparison to it on earth. And that's what Assyria is feeling. It's not just that God ran roughshod over his enemy. It's not just that he led them away to destruction. It's that while they are there, he spends every moment of their existence terrifying them. Egypt won't do that for you. No earthly deliverer will do that for you. Only God does that for his people. Fourth word, tambourines. Say, that word doesn't fit, but it does. Look at verse 32. And every blow of the rod of punishment which the Lord will lay on him will be with the music of tambourines and lyres. What in the world is Isaiah bringing here? While God is afflicting the enemy, you know what begins to happen? God's over here just, you know, pile driving him. And the people in church are like, yeah, yeah. And they're playing the tambourines to the thump of God beating your enemy. Really? That's what Isaiah said. Every blow, every blow that God hits your enemy with a rod, you're going to be keeping beat with the tambourine. The lyre, right? Some kind of an Israeli guitar, I guess. You're going to be strumming along, keeping the beat. God will provide the bass beat, and you're going to play along 
Worship music like you can't imagine, all to the destruction and the judgment of your enemy. This is what God does for his people. Right now, you trust in Egypt who can't save, Egypt who can't deliver, Egypt who can't stop your bully, Egypt who can't terrify him, Egypt who will not allow you to celebrate your deliverance, but God will. You're actually going to celebrate the judgment of your enemy with tambourine and lyre playing. You say, no way. Skip to the end. Isaiah 66, verse 22. For just as the new heavens and the new earth which I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. And it shall be from new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says the Lord. Now that's the millennial kingdom. That's the reign of Christ. That's, woo, what a great day of worship. And then they go on a field trip. Are you ready? Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be an abhorrence to mankind. Where are we going on a field trip? We're going to go look at everybody God destroyed. We're going to go mock the dead. We're going to go relish in the judgment of the wicked. You've read Revelation 19. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. You sing that song at Christmas and you didn't even know it. It's the Hallelujah chorus. Only it's not about the birth of the Savior, it's about the destruction of the wicked. When they judge the harlot, that's false religion, and they judge the wicked, and God begins to pour out his wrath and avenge the blood of his bondservants, you're going to hear this massive cry of a multitude in heaven cry out, Hallelujah! And somebody's going to say, what are they saying hallelujah for? And they'll say, look at her smoke, she's burning. And they're singing hallelujah because they can see the pillars of smoke off of the fire of judgment on their adversaries. And the next thing you know, it grows and more show up. A voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters. We want to see. And it turns into this great hallelujah chorus over the destruction of the wicked. It's just a picture of God so thoroughly annihilating your enemy. He's going to take them completely out, and your celebration will be unending and glorious and great because God will have judged the one who afflicted you. I have a, I, have, I think it's kind of sick and twisted. I don't know why I enjoy it, but I do, and it probably is something I should repent of. Now everybody's ready to listen. So. But, like these last couple of weeks when the Rangers or playing in the playoffs. And I didn't have anything against the Arizona Diamondbacks or the Baltimore Orioles or the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, but I hate the Houston Astros. So one of my great enjoyments after beating the Houston Astros is to find any press conference or interview I can find of the Houston Astros. Just to watch them have to eat crow. I know that's probably wrong and not very Christian. But I thoroughly enjoy it. I'm going to look up online and listen to them interview their manager and interview their players and interview. I know everybody loves him, but I'm not an Altuve fan. I want to see them interview Altuve and just hear him talk about how bad it was to lose and to lose to the Rangers. And I know that's sick and twisted, but that's kind of what they're doing here. After we have our victory, after we have our deliverance, after God leads our enemy away, after God carries them off to eternal fire and judgment, and I've been singing while God beat them, the next question is, can I watch? And God says, yes. Come ahead. We're going to sing and celebrate. Hallelujah, while God thoroughly annihilates your enemy. No one else would ever do that for you. No one else would ever avenge you like that. No one else would ever care for you like that. One more word. Topheth. Topheth. That last line of verse 32 says, And in battles, brandishing weapons, he will fight them. For Topheth 
has long been ready. Indeed, it has been prepared for the king. He has made it deep and large, a pyre of fire with plenty of wood. The breath of the Lord, like a torrent of brimstone, sets it afire. He says that Topheth has long been ready. What is Topheth? Well, you've seen it before, other places in Scripture. Jeremiah 7. They have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom. To burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, and it did not come into my mind. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no longer be called Topheth, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of the slaughter. For they will bury in Topheth, because there is no other place. So in Jeremiah's day, you have this place which is called Topheth. He says there's some high places there. It's a unique high place, because it's not on a mountain, it's actually in a valley. And the valley is called the valley of the son of Hinnom. And there the children of Israel did despicable things. They burned their children in the fire as sacrifices to Moloch. They slaughtered their children. And God said, I hate that place. You're no longer going to call it Topheth. You're going to call it a burial site for the wicked. They're going to bury in Hinnom. It's a place of slaughter. Later, Jeremiah talks about it again in Jeremiah 19, 6. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when this place will no longer be called Topheth or the valley of Ben-Hinnom. Ben is son of. Uh, that's like when they, um, trying to think of other people you've heard um, in the Bible when it uses Ben first, but that's what it means, son of. But son of Hinnom also is Ben Hinnom. The other they're going to call it the Valley of Slaughter. So you have this place, Topheth, sometimes called Topheth, sometimes called Ben Hinnom. Topheth literally means place of fire. And in Jeremiah's day, Topheth is a place south of Jerusalem, and it's the city dump. You have one. It's this place of burning where you carried off all your refuge, all your trash, all the guts and carcasses of all the sacrificed animals, all the hides, all of that stuff is carried to Topheth. It's thrown in the pit and it's always burning in Topheth. And because of all the detestable rotting carcasses, it's full of maggots and it is a nasty, smelly, horrific, awful place. And so God spoke to Jeremiah about it. But then we get to the New Testament. And you take that word Topheth, or more specifically that word ben Hinnom. And in Matthew 5.22, Jesus said, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. The word Jesus used for the fiery hell is Gehenna. Which sounds an awful lot like Ben Hinnom, doesn't it? Because it's that Arabic or Greek translation of that word. Jesus, when he wanted to describe hell to his people, he described it like the local dump. Do you want to go to that place? And nobody wants to go because it's foul, it's rotting. I mean, imagine a place where they're piling dead animal carcasses and burning them. You can imagine the stench of a place like that. It, it never lets up. In fact, in Mark 9, 42, here's Jesus describing it again. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him if with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he'd been cast into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into the hell, into the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into Gehenna where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Gehenna, Ben-Hinnom, Topheth, it's all the same place. It's the city dump. And it's the place Jesus used on earth to give the best analogy that he could for hell where it's always burning and it always stinks and it's overrun by maggots and you don't want to be in that place. And here, as Isaiah speaks of this place, he says it has long been ready. If you've been to funerals lately, I haven't, wasn't at any of these this past week, so I don't know if they use this verse or not, but it's common at funerals in order to try to give encouragement to believers to read John 14, 1 to 3. In which Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. It's a tremendous promise of comfort to a believer to know that the Lord has gone to prepare a place for us. Isaiah 33 is the lost person's equivalent of John 14, 1 to 3. They also have a place which the Lord has prepared, and it is ready. Matthew 25, 41, he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Originally prepared for Satan and those who led a revolt in heaven, but it will also include those who have attacked and rejected God and afflicted his people, and he says it's ready. It has been prepared for the king. He says it is deep and it is large. There is room for you. There is a pyre of fire with plenty of wood. Have you read Revelation 9? Everybody focuses on the locusts, but have you ever noticed when they take and they open the abyss? Have you ever heard what is said there when they open it up? It says smoke comes out of that place and blots out the sun. I mean, this is a barbecue pit, folks. This is hot. It is burning. And then Perhaps one of the most peculiar statements that I don't know if you've thought of or not, but the breath of the Lord, like a torrent of brimstone, sets it afire. Hell doesn't get lit by Satan. Satan's not running around with a torch. He's not running around afflicting people. He's not the one who lights the fire. He's not the one who holds men captive in their judgment. It's God. Here he's spoken of almost like a dragon, that God builds the fire and God throws a man in it. It's God who in his fury sets it ablaze. He's the one who captures men. He condemns them. He torments them. He's the one that lights the fire. In Revelation 14, verse 9, it says, Another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image, whoever receives the mark of his name. He's the punisher. And what you're reading here from Isaiah is not a threat to Jerusalem. Certainly, if they don't believe in the Lord, this is where they go. But this is the letter of invitation to them. And the letter is very simply this. Do you have anybody else in the world that would do this for you? Do you have anybody else in the world that would so thoroughly deal with your Assyrian threat? Do you have anybody else in the world that would so thoroughly deal with those who persecute you and attack you and condemn you? You don't have anybody that cares for you like that. You don't have anybody that will show up to be your hero and avenge you like that. I mean, we love the Hollywood movies, you know, where somebody's in danger and the hero comes breaking through, right? And the hero who never stops looking and never stops hunting and searches and finds me and rescues me at the end and kills all the bad guys. And I mean, that's a happy movie, right? I guess. It's all fake. It's all phony. That kind of stuff doesn't happen. I'm not saying that no one that's ever afflicted never gets delivered, but not like this. You've never seen a deliverer like this. You've never heard of a savior like this. This is a father that's crying out to his son, a son that's being afflicted in the pig pen, a son that's being mocked in a foreign land. And the father is saying, son, if you would come home, if you would repent and if you would return, not only do I promise grace to you, not only do I promise provision and blessing to you, not only do I promise to turn your darkness into light and give you hope, but I will then return to that country and I will burn it to the ground. I will deal with those who afflicted you. I will deliver you so thoroughly that no one will ever harm you or humiliate you again. He alone is your Savior. He alone is your deliverer. He alone can handle your foe. And that's good news, even to the church today. I would have thought that had been good news to Israel, but it's good news to us. You're going to go into this world, and Jesus promises affliction. He promises persecution. You're going to be hated. It's going to happen. But rest assured, he knows. And he will deal with those who deal with you. We don't have to take our own revenge. We leave room, beloved, for the wrath of God, right? And now you see what that looks like. Let him handle it. He's better than you. And if you're not a child of God, th this isn't actually written as a threat of this is what God will do to you, though it's quite similar. This is actually an encouragement to you to say, would you rather him be for you or against you? 
This one who comes from a remote place with burning anger and dense smoke, filled with indignation, who has a tongue like a consuming fire. Would you rather him before you or against you? If you're picking kickball teams, are you going to pick him or are you not going to pick him? This is the team you want to be on. Come to him. You say, well, if I do, I'll have to leave my sin, yeah? And if I do, I have to submit to him, yeah? And if I do, I have to forsake all my other gods and all my other saviors, yeah, you do. But still, you don't have anyone like him. This is the call of Isaiah to false sons. Don't mess around with him. There has never been a father like this father. Don't be a false son. He's certainly not a fake father. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you because you are God, and we praise you because you're worthy. And Lord, we are thankful that you are such a father, a gracious father, a father that blesses and provides, a father that gives hope and celebrates and joy, but also a father who avenges, a father who delivers his children from their oppressor and a father who deals with those who oppressed them. That's who you are. You are a good father. It is a joy and a delight that we call you our father, that we know that no one has ever cared for us or loved us like you. No one has chosen to save us as you have, and no one will deliver us as you do. You alone are a father who avenges his children, and we are so thankful you're our father. Lord God, guide us and direct us to be better children. But we thank you, and we love you, and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.